You're listening to The Vincast, Australia's premier wine podcast, which comes out almost every week and is completely free of charge. Now, as it's free, it does rely on the support of the listeners. So how can you support the podcast? Well, a really easy way is to just get in touch with myself uh, on Twitter or Instagram, Facebook, or via the website intrepidwino.com. You can also support the podcast by subscribing to the podcast, either on iTunes or the podcast app on your iPhone, or any number of different podcast downloading platforms. Please, please give me a rating and a review because it does help the uh, the podcast get out to a bigger audience and provides feedback not only to potential listeners but also to potential guests who you might want to hear from on this very podcast. You can also support the podcast by going to differentdrop.com forward slash intrepid wino and purchasing some of the wines made by former guests and future guests of the podcast and remembering to use the special code intrepid wino at purchase. And of course, you can help by um, buying a subscription package to Wine Companion um, using the code intrepid30 to get a 30% discount. So thank you very much, guys, for listening to another episode, and thank you for your support of the podcast. On episode 81 of the Vincast, I chat with Max Allen, legendary Australian wine writer and cider aficionado. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is James Scarsbrook, otherwise known as the Intrepid Wino, and welcome to another episode of the Vincast. I'm really excited to to um, share with you uh, this week's episode with uh, a really exciting guest. But uh, I hope you enjoyed the most recent episode with Alex Byrne uh, and got interested, particularly in the Noisy Ritual uh, program which is, of course, the Urban Winery uh, here in Melbourne. And uh, you can sign up for the 2016 program and uh, actually get the chance to make wine with some other uh, wine lovers just like yourselves. And if you do that, don't forget to uh, put when you put in all your details when you're signing up uh, in the dietary um, requirements section, put in the code the Vincast. Uh, that way they know that you heard about the program via the podcast uh, and they'll actually give you a, a, an opportunity to taste a bottle of from 2015 program so you'll get an idea about the kind of wines that you'll actually be able to get um, get a chance to make. So for this week, I have Max Allen, uh, someone I've wanted on the podcast pretty much since the day I started it. Uh, Max is absolutely one of the foremost wine writers in Australia, uh, an amazing authority on Australian wine. Um, and uh, he actually is also a big, big lover of cider, so much so that he actually makes his own cider as well, something that I didn't actually touch on in our very, um, very detailed and lengthy chat. So um, I hope you enjoy this episode. Please uh, stick around until the end of the episode so you can find out how you can get in contact with Max and myself to, to share your impressions. Um, but until then i'll see you on the other side max it is great to finally have you on the podcast thank you very much for making some time in uh, no doubt your busy schedule no worries uh and um uh, as i was just mentioning i start every episode of my podcast by asking my guests if they can remember the first time uh they interacted with wine in a different way that made them think that that was something special and they possibly wanted to mm. find out more about it i i started drinking wine and every other kind of alcohol I could get my hands on when I was, I don't know, a teenager, like everybody else. <laughs> so it was part of the spectrum, you know, along with... I grew up in, in England. Okay. Um, moved out to Australia 20, almost 25 years ago. Yeah. But, you know, um, my formative drinking years were spent in London. Uh, so it was, you know, one and a half plastic... One and a half litre plastic bottles of cider and, and, and sneaky little half bottles of vodka and the usual stuff that teenagers 
started on back in those days in London. Sure. And cheap bottles of, of French red from the supermarket. You know, like nothing, you know, it was just another drink, right? So what, there wasn't really a stigma about wine being like, you know, oh, that's for, that's for posh people, oh, that's for old I'm, people I'm talk- kind of thing? No, absolutely not. Not there? At that level. Yeah. Not like, you know, literally two pound a bottle bottles of, of Fitu or something from sure, the south sure. of France or Bulgarian litre bottles of Bulgarian Cabernet. You know? Yeah, okay. That was that was very much Car- the kind Car- of it, it cask was, wine wasn't particularly big there. Uh, no, nowhere near as big as it was here. There <laughs> were there were boxes of, of wine. Um, stoles of Chelsea would have you know you'd be able to get four litre boxes of Stoles claret and things like that. Right. Um, but I wasn't. I mean, and you know I, I like drinking, but when it came to beer, I was really began to be quite discerning mm. as, as I got into drinking beer. Geeky. <laughs> uh, no, yeah, a little bit geeky, but just a bit discerning. I mean, there is a very embarrassing kind of nerdy story when I was um, a kid, you know, like 11 or 10 or 11. Um, I'd, I'd read my my mum's, uh, you know, Saturday, Sunday supplement magazines and see these stories in the magazines about, you know, when they get chefs in to rate mince pies or baked beans or you know epicure, yeah. epicure does it every year sure and, yeah, yeah you know the the, the what, what's what's like what's a seasonal best, kind of thing what's the best of the um tomato soups on the market or something well, that's one he is here is where's the best meat pie all that kind of stuff yeah, yeah. so I, those those stories intrigued me and as as a kid i actually went out and bought all the different brands of lemonade i could find okay to find out which one i liked most right so i obviously had this underlying sense of discernment like some some things that you can buy are better than others to your taste yeah right so i went out and tasted them all and worked out that schweppes lemonade was the one in my opinion this you know what do i know i'm I'm 10 years old (laughs) that's the one that appealed to me most right so when i started drinking mostly it was just for the alcohol Mm. but then after a while i began to realize well you know that that two liter plastic bottle of cider actually i prefer to that one sure so there is this kind of germ of of being critical, I suppose, yep, yep. or discerning about booze, um, and then when I went to uh, I went to art school in England for four years and and became yeah a bit geeky about beer. You know, I was living in in Brighton and there was a lovely um, you know culture of of real ale from the campaign for real ale. So I worked out which pubs served the best beer and that kind of thing. But wine was still something I drank, but it wasn't you know the the pivotal thing in my life. And then I came out to Australia. Um, to visit family and friends with my family in uh, 1990, mm-hmm. and it was on a tour of of the Barossa and Clare Valleys. That's that is the that's the turning point. That's when I walked into the cellar door at Skilligalee and was handed this glass of wine. I was like, oh god, do I have to be here? I was like, how old was I? 22. Wasn't particularly interested in you know. It was a bit of a pain actually to go on this tour with my family well, that's what family, it felt like parents, yeah that's really. right family holiday yeah, yeah, of that when you're 22 it's hard and enough this, when you're a teenager oh, that's right well yeah hard enough as a parent now um and had this glass of wine handed to me and it was like oh hold on what what is this this isn't like any wine i've ever had yeah and then we went to i mean i can remember it's so clear and i've recounted this story so many times i'm probably making it up now um but I, in my memory we then went to mitchell's and had their pepper tree shiraz mm-hmm. And, you know, it sounds corny, but driving from Mitchell's into uh, the Skillicalee pub, Seven Hill pub, sorry, <clears throat> um, you know, there's kangaroo bouncing along by the side of the car and there's vineyards and we're in this pub in the Clare Valley and drinking these beautiful old wines that you can go down to the cellar and, you know, pick off the shelf for yourself. And, yeah. and it's affordable, it's cheap. Then we went to Seven Hill, the amazing winery run by, you know, um, the Jesuits. Mm-hmm. And there's this sense of history and culture and delicious wine. Mm. And then we went to the Barossa and we went to Lehman's and St. Hallett and, and finished at Rockford. So in that one day, I had this kind of immersion. That was all in one day? That was all in one day, yeah. Oh, yeah. Wow. <laughs> it was a big day. Yeah. Um, we had this immersion in from, from drinking cheap wine and enjoying it, but not understanding how amazing it could be. Yeah to just being completely immersed in wonderful wine and the culture of wine and the people and the history and the setting. I mean, the Clare is still, for me, one of the, my favourite 
regions mm -hmm. in Australia because mm -hmm. it's so beautiful. You yeah. Know? It's just got this amazing, it's in the middle of, of wheat fields effectively and it's this oasis of, of vineyards and beautiful gum forests and... So it's also a region that it, it is completely Australian. That's right. You know, it is so quintessential. Um, you know, the gum trees and, and and like you look at some regions in Australia and you kind of think, well, yeah, it's Australian, but it could be somewhere else. It could be in New Zealand or it could be in well, having in, that in having that. US. Well, that's, I had been to when I was living in, in in growing up in London. I'd been with a friend to um, you know one summer holidays. We went to their house in the south of France, which was in the middle of kind of the outskirts of the Bordeaux region, the entre deux Mer region. Yeah, okay. So I kind of glimpsed, but I was, you know, 13, so I wasn't drinking. No. You know, but I, so I, so I, I'd kind of glimpsed what wine country and wine culture is like. Sure. You know, I remember going to the end of vintage festival in the local co-op, you know. Wow. And ta big, long trestle tables groaning with, you know, sauce local sausage and jugs of wine. And so I'd kind of – but you, but you're still a kid at that point, so you're not really kind of engaged in that appreciation of, of wine culture. It's it's an appreciation of French culture, but sure, it's not sure. wine culture. But so my first exposure to Australian wine culture was, as you say, this quintessentially Australian region. Mm. So And that, that was the turning point. That was when I went – so then, then we spent. Then I spent a week in Melbourne and a week in Sydney. After that, before going back to the UK, and so I discovered, you know, this early '90s Melbourne pub culture, and you know, um, it was just when the licensing laws were beginning to be relaxed. So mm. there was, you know, much more accessibility to wine culture. And then um, uh, a relative in Sydney took me to a very fancy restaurant, Tony Bilson's place, when he had it near Circular Quay. Yeah, um, and. Back then, you know, this makes me sound like such an old fogey, but back then, if you're there with people who are earning, you know, um, I was with people who were still only in their early 20s, but one of them worked in hospitality, one of them worked in finance or something, so we drank Grange with lunch. <laughs> now, I know, but then, because not not long after that, I moved to Melbourne and worked in a drive through bottle shop. In the early 90s, we were still selling Grange for less than 100 bucks a bottle. Yeah. Which is probably still a lot for those for those days. That's wasn't, right. There wasn't but else. Relatively speaking, yeah. now you want to go and buy Grange and you can't buy it in a local drive through bottle shop for a start. No. And you've got to pay seven, eight hundred or six, seven, eight hundred bucks. And yeah. a restaurant, nothing under a thousand. Yeah. That that kind of quality restaurant. So it's for current vintage as well. Inaccessible. Yeah. Whereas back then, so in that space, what I'm saying is in the space of two weeks, I'd had my first mind-blowing wine experience yeah. and drunk Grange. Yeah. What else am I going to do? <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like uh, this, my life path had changed in that I just had to learn more about wine. It sure. was just like what is this incredible world where that no 10-year-old boy who want, tastes all the different lemonades is allowed to play in a field that involves drinking alcoholic beverages, yeah, yeah, and 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 going to wonderful places, and and you know, so I went back to the UK and uh, got a job in a bottle shop. We, you were studying at art school, had been, yeah. So okay. I finished that. So I worked in a in a wine shop for a, a couple of years. Um, uh, decided to come out to Australia to move in uh, with a woman who's I'm now married to, yeah. Um, and in between worked on the International Wine Challenge in London. Okay. So that was where I met wine journalists like Robert Joseph and Oz Clark and how did, how did you get involved with that? Oh, I just put my – just you know, they were looking for people to be stewards for yeah, okay. the six weeks of the show or whatever. Yeah. So I spent six weeks or longer, I think, unpacking boxes and, and cataloging bottles and doing – because, you know, even back then in 92 – it was still 5,000 or 6,000 entries or something ridiculous. It was mm -hmm. a huge undertaking. Sure. But again, a compressed uh, wine education. Okay. You know, because we were opening for the, for the period of the wine competition tasting for the wine challenge in London, we were opening, you know, 20 burgundies for the burgundy bracket to be yeah. tasted. Yeah. And once the judges are finished with those bottles, what are we going to do? We're going to taste them. Sure. So it was this incredibly intensive education in wine and they were quite supportive about that like they, oh, they, they kind of encouraged absolutely. you to, yeah, to yeah, taste yeah, the wines yeah 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 so the people they attracted to those um events uh, uh usually people like me who were just beginning out on their kind of you know sure career so it was there's a lot of glass washing and, and unpacking and 
lugging of boxes as well. But that's good. That's fine. Of course. Um, so you said that like that's how you kind of got introduced to to wine yeah, journalists, well, wine that's critics, right. that kind so, of thing. So I thought. So that was when I thought. Well, he, hold on. Here are some people who are. Well, they obviously love wine. Mm. <laughs> that's patently obvious, and yet they get paid to write about it. Yeah. What's going on there? So having an art, you know, art school background, and enjoying communication through words or images or whatever, mm. you know, I thought, well, if maybe I'll just keep an eye out for opportunities when I come to Australia, you know. Had you um, had much of an interest in, in literature or in, in, yeah, in yeah. writing so, up to so, that point? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, I felt that I could, well, was able to string, you know, a sentence together. Sure. Um, and coincidentally, when I arrived in Melbourne in 92, Melbourne was just coming out of recession, South Bank had just opened. The recession no, we had to have. That's the one. <laughs> and it was just when people, when Melbourne's current, you know, things like the Dogs Bar had just opened. Yeah, okay. Uh, Melbourne Wine Room hadn't opened yet. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of the kind of pivotal um, moments in, in Melbourne and Australia's gastronomic development were yeah. just beginning to happen around the same time. So I arrived, I arrived Walters? In, was Walters open? Walters just opened, just that's open. right. Yeah, yeah okay. so... Um, I arrived in Melbourne at just the right time because mm. there was this mostly, you know, youngish group of people who were driving a lot of those things, you mm -hmm. know. So an example would be Patrick Walsh. Have you spoken to Patrick Walsh on the on the show? He, so, uh, he, I keep trying to get him on. <laughs> I keep trying to get him so on. So Patrick Walsh is a good example of somebody who now through his wine import business, Sellerhand, you know, um, has uh, helped introduce German Riesling to uh, a lot of Australian people in yep. the last... 20 years. Yep. He was a waiter at, at Walters at that time. So, right. so there's a lot of people like that who were just starting out themselves. Yeah. So I was um, I arrived in Melbourne, had this experience of working in the UK wine trade and on this show, and at the same time that I arrived, Divine Magazine had just opened up in Melbourne. Okay. So Divine, now this is, this is uh, Children, this is before the internet. <laughs> it is. It's before no the such internet. Thing as blogs. You know, that's right. There's no such thing as blogs. So or Twitter. The whole concept of what we're doing right now completely inaccessible to everybody. Sure. Effectively. Yeah. Um, certainly nowhere near as accessible as it is now. So there was this magazine, food and wine magazine, way ahead of its time in a way called Divine. Mm -hmm. That opened up. I found it in a local newsagent's full colour, glossy, but also really interesting stories on things like heritage apples. Yeah, you know that that people are talking about now, but weren't talking about twenty years ago. Yeah, on uh, Yarry Earring's new Merlot wine that he was selling for the extraordinary and an outrageous price of a hundred bucks a bottle mm. you know you um, wouldn't get that for Merlot these days. interviews where there was a story about doing vintage at bass philip you know so it was this wonderful magazine full of of uh really good stories and beautiful design and the the bloke that was putting it together andrew Wood, was in st kilda just down the road from me so yep. i literally just phoned him up and said hey can i write a story for you mm -hmm. and because he was then and continued to be a uh you know it was a volunteer kind of everybody pitching in together, nobody really got paid mm. kind of thing. Um, and so I worked on Divine as a volunteer for the first few years. So that kind of introduced me to a few people in Melbourne. And, and did you pitch stories or did you kind of have some no, stuff he, you kind of he, wanted to write about? He needed he needed somebody to kind of help him out on the magazine. Yeah. And because I had the art background, we did everything ourselves mm. from, from layout to design and, you know, the equivalent today is alchemy. Okay. Right, so it's, it was very much the same kind of idea. Sure, not nowhere near as slick as alchemy. <laughs> um, uh, you know, if anybody remembers, <laughs> again, if anybody remembers, uh, you know, the old. Oh, I can't remember the name of the model of the Mac computer, but people would remember very chunky. Uh, uh, unglamorous design. I think it was the Apple II? No, not not the little box. Oh, okay. Not the Apple Classic, but certainly one of those very... We were using those very early Macs, right. you know, and Quark Express and, thing, you know, programs <laughs> like that. On It was, in retrospect, you know, looks quite clunky now. Then it was cutting edge, right? Stuff that I thought of using in primary school. Probably, sorry, yeah, sorry, all right. Sorry, don't rub it in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but... Um, 
So we so through through divine, I you know was suddenly introduced to you know a whole world of what was going on in Melbourne. Divine held a, uh, did a lot of tastings, mm-hmm. um, and you know we we met a lot of people, and that was how I got my first story published in a proper newspaper. So through Divine, I met a photographer, James Boddington, who was a, a mate of Andrew's and did a lot of photography for the magazine. Mm-hmm. And James was and still is a photographer at the age. Right. And, uh, you know, it, uh, literally took me through the back door of the age building when it was in Spencer Street. Yeah. The old brick edifice. And uh, I, I put a typewritten manuscript on the Epicure editor's desk. It wow. sounds like the 1930s, but it's like the early 90s because I didn't have a computer then. Yeah. I did not own. It was perfectly possible to live in the world without owning a computer. What about without or a Or a mobile phone, <laughs> right? It was perfectly possible. Nobody thought that they were missing anything. Anyway, so I, I, I wrote a story on a typewriter about what? Earingberg Vineyard. Right, Okay. Um, cause again, I'd arrived in Melbourne and one of the first things I did was went out to the Yarra Valley, um, and soon learned about this wonderful historic vineyard that had been there since, or the winery that had been there since the 1860s mm-hmm. and, and kind of, it seemed that nobody else knew about this place. It was closed to the public and it was, you know, the wines were not easy to get Yeah, back then. <clears throat> so I did some, and did research found the wonderful, you know, history of the place, mm-hmm. typed up, went out there, talked to the white, the winemaker, Gilda Peary, um, visited those incredible old cellars, you know, that in many ways haven't changed mm-hmm. since 1920 when they were 21, when they were closed down, um, and wrote the story and it got published. Far out. Yeah, I know. I know. Now it's... It, in, in the same way that you had the opportunity to, to, you know, drink Grange that first week, it's sort of like going into Epicure and just sort of saying, I've written this story and, yeah. and being lucky enough to yeah. have it published... Is, uh, yeah, but what not I, what really going to happen? These but days. as I say, I could kind of, I could string a sentence together. Yeah, of and course. and still, you know, why are why is it the case that more wine and food blogs aren't as highly regarded as um, as well known uh, or wield as much influence, arguably, as a lot of print media? One of the reasons is that the writing's not very good. Well, that's the thing. Like there is that there there are, I guess, sort of filters before it actually comes gets to print, and that's that, right. that, that that is editors essentially. You know, blogs, um, Twitter, Instagram. You know, just the, the 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 wine logging apps. People are just putting their that's thoughts right. out yeah. into the ether. And some of, some of that stuff is great. Sure, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that every. I'm not one of those. But it, it, mainstream print media people that thinks that all blogs are evil that for, by any stretch of the imagination. And there but, are some really good people like Campbell Mattinson's a really good case in point mm-hmm. of a writer who, who initially started out as a sports writer. Sure. Um, fell in love with wine. Very similar story. To, I'm sure we all have. Anybody who's decided to make wine in their life has a similar story to mine. You know, you, you, you've teased these stories out of other people. Um, Campbell started blogging and, and getting involved with the forums and, and writing tasting notes on other people's websites and got noticed, mm-hmm. you know, because Campbell has a unique way with words. He's, he's a really, really good writer yeah. and therefore got work through established print and other media mm-hmm. and has now written books and, you know, so, it, so it's not that all blogging is evil. I'm not saying that for a second, but I'm saying... In a way, what I was doing by putting that typewritten manuscript was, you know, now you just put it out there, yeah, you know, on a blog or something. What 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 the the scenario is now is that the the audience is the filter, and they're yeah. being required to kind of look at all these different blogs and all these different people who are just putting their their content out, you know, into the world, and they're having to decide whether they think it's good or not, and whether yeah. they're engaging. I guess there is a kind of um, not even well. I guess it's de- democratic to a certain extent. I wouldn't say it's uh, socialist, um, but at the same time, you know, you kind of look at it and go, "Yeah, well, I can see where they're kind of connecting with an audience, but it's not necessarily what would be considered to be good content, good writing." Yeah, and um, so I, I was. I think I was lucky. Obviously, the writing was good enough for 
that editor to say, oh, yeah, we'll run this. <laughs> because, I mean, I, you know, she, she had no idea who I was or, sure. or background. I sure. obviously explained that, but, you know, but I was effectively coming in from coming in cold. Yeah. Uh, and then, then, you, then it's up to you to take advantage of that opportunity. Sure. You know, so then it was a question of me saying, well, I've got another story idea if you're interested or, you know, so it was then I was just... Um, have you got something that I'll go away and I'll put something together and come back yeah, to Yeah, but I was still doing the stuff for Divine too. So, okay. I, was, so I was able to kind of use, um, and I did for many years, do, do that, uh, kept doing that. Yeah. Were you, were you able to support yourself with that kind of thing or were you having to no, I work still, as well? No, uh, I worked in, in the drive-in bottle shop, McCoppins in Johnson Street for yep. years uh, and worked cellar door at Coldstream Hills. Mm-hmm. So for a while, uh, a couple of years, or was it just one? Can't remember. Um, helped James Halliday out, like so many other people did up there, with, with the companion, with his tasting. Mm-hmm. Oh, I know this is years before the companion. Oh, okay. It was uh, what was it called then? I can't remember what it was called then. I don't think it was called the companion then. If even if it was, it was the size of a of an airport novel rather than a, a Bible. Mm-hmm. You know, um, again. <laughs> Children, this will uh, find you'll find this hard to believe. But when I started writing about wine twenty y- odd years ago, there were <sighs> between five hundred and seven hundred wineries in Australia. Probably yeah. not even that many. Yeah. And now there are producers. So if you take into account people who have wine made for them or use somebody else's winery to make their wine, mm. what anywhere between two and a half and three thousand. Yeah. Um, it was a different. It was a different, very, very, very different scene back in the early 90s. Yeah. It was the export boom was taking off but had yet to really go gangbusters like it did in the mid-90s. Yeah. Um, it was it, – everything was on – everything was on the up. When I went to the Barossa in 1990 on that initial kind of, you know, um, epiphany day, in 1990 that was still only – three or four years after the South Australian government was paying people in the Barossa to rip out their vines mm. because things were so bad. Yeah. So it's, it's, you know, now, so I've been lucky enough, if you like, to see a complete cycle mm. from the early 90s when export was going crazy and people were planting like crazy from the mid-90s onwards when new wineries were coming on stream, you know, every day a new winery would open kind of thing. Yeah. Every week. Um, I've seen that. I've seen the crash at the beginning of the 2000s Yeah, when exports stopped rising to the same extent when we had the dot-com crash, all those other things that happened when Australian wine went from being absolute flavour of the month in the UK and the US Mm. to being completely on the nose. And nobody could win a trick. And nobody was interested in good Australian wine. And Australian wine had, this is in export markets, had completely cornered the cheap and cheerful end of the market and yeah. nobody took it seriously. Yeah. To the point now where every week, and you'd, you'd see this, you see stories from coming out of London and New York and all over the place saying, gee, Australian wine's interesting, isn't it? Yeah. Isn't Australian wine amazing at the moment? Well, it had to evolve. But but it's it's exactly the same boom and bust cycle that Australian wine has been through, yeah, over and over again mm. for the 150 years of its history or more. So, but it's been really interesting for me to see the whole thing from positive to really really negative to now positive again. Mm-hmm. So, at what point did, um, as far as the, the the writing, whether it was divine or whether it was the age that you started to kind of people said, oh, this Max Allen. You know, he he. I like the way he writes, and you know, like let's kind of seek him out to, to to find out what he thinks about you know our wines, our winery, all that, that kind of thing. Yeah, I reckon I was writing for the age. So I wrote for the age from ninety three to ninety seven mm-hmm. for the Epicure section. Um, and look, you know, I was one of a few people that were just getting into writing about wine at that time. Mm-hmm. Um, so Tim White from the Financial Review yep. started about the same time as me. Um, it was probably when I published my first book, Red and White, in 97. Mm-hmm. That's when uh, certainly, that's when the Australian came knocking and said, would you like to write for us? Because they'd just been through a big change, changing who was writing about what for their magazine and their lifestyle section. Yeah. Um, 
and the wine magazine, Gourmet Traveller Wine Magazine, just started up the same year or yeah. the year after. Um, and again said, you know, that's I like that book. Come and write for us as well. So uh, it was it was the publishing the book that really did it probably. The the book um, was completely your concept. Or yeah, Red and, Red and White Wine Made Simple um, was the first book. And again, this sounds kind of naive, not, not naive, but it sounds like they were more naive times in a way. Uh, in the mid-90s, Jill Duplay published a book called uh, New Food, mm-hmm. um, or even early 90s. And so Jill Duplay people would know as uh, being, you know, one half of uh, Jill and Terry, Terry Durac, mm-hmm. um, who's Sydney Morning Herald food critic, and at that time they were in Melbourne and they were kind of the power couple of, of Melbourne food. I've you know, heard stories. She, yeah, she writes recipes, he writes reviews, and they're, they're very influential in you know the early years of the Melbourne Food and Wine Festival and stuff like that. They used to drink in, in the George, in the Melbourne Wine Room, mm-hmm. in Divine Magazine, not just drink, they ate too. They used to hang out. <laughs> that makes it sound like they were just drinking, but mostly... Um, we had an office at Divine upstairs at yep. the Melbourne Wine Room, which is very dangerous. Yeah, you know, yeah If you're of ever course. starting out, don't ever get an office that's above <laughs> one of Melbourne's best wine. Because, again, you know, at that time it was a lot of the people who are now doing, you know, really influential things like Neil Prentice, yep. who's got Mundara Vineyard. Previous and, guest. Um, Prentice Wines and is one half of Big Huey's Diner. And, you know, so Neil's been, you know, a big figure in the Melbourne Wine, so he was working at, at Melbourne Wine Room at that yeah. time. So people like that, right? So it was, it was, and I remember talking to Terry and Jill about saying, you know, new food's been so influential, like the design of it, the whole feel of it, that this kind of, um, you know, the accessibility. It of just it. felt like she encapsulated, she captured a, a new feeling about food in Australia through that book, right? Yeah. And it was really bold design, and uh, it felt like, and really uh, bold photography. And I said, well, why can't I – I'll use that as a template and do it with wine. Mm-hmm. How can we do a basic introduction to wine that's just really bold, colourful, personal, quirky, that doesn't have maps or graphs or scores or, you know, diagrams or anything, Yeah, but just captures in word and image like New Food did the excitement that I feel about wine and getting into it. Mm-hmm. So I thought – Oh, well, I'll go and talk to Jill and Terry. They don't know who I am. They know I write for The Age, but, you know. So we have a drink and they say, oh, we'll just talk to our publisher. So I literally just went to the publisher with a few kind of mock-ups of what I thought the book was going to look like Mm -hmm. and said, here's a new book. Nobody's ever done a book about wine like this. Mm -hmm. It's kind of modelled on new food. You did new food. Why don't you do this wine book as well? And she took a punt on us. So I I kind of went in collaboration with the photographer Um. So we kind of shared the risk in that respect. You know, normally any wine, most books, that you'd write the text and then the photographs would be commissioned or sourced from somewhere else, right? Yeah, yeah. But with this, because we went into it together, we worked on the images and the text at the same time. Wow, okay. So we went around the... So we, we spent a lot of time on that book, far more than you'd probably be able to justify now. Uh, and so it was, you know, it was successful. It won awards and it, and it sold pretty well. Mm-hmm. Um, but that kind of, I think that it, it made a statement, you know, it, it made people turn around and go, well, who is this bloke? You know, he's, he's got something refreshing, a, a refreshing angle on wine. Mm-hmm. It's different. Mm-hmm. And so I think that was the way that I, that, well, that was, that's, that's, then when I started, that's how I started writing for the Australian. Right. And at a certain point, you were able to support yourself completely with with yeah, writing communication uh, from kind of around thing? that time. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, and I've been very lucky. And it was about, and then I don't know, six, five or six years later, Gourmet Traveller again came to me and said, "Would you like to write for us?" Mm-hmm. And so, between those two things and other freelance pieces and. Um, regular gigs that come and go so writing for a magazine you know, on a monthly basis you might do that for a couple of years and then that might they might move on to another person or change their mind editorially or whatever and also you know public speaking type things you know mm-hmm. emceeing wine dinners and things like that Melbourne Food and Wine Festival that kind all of that thing. kind of thing so between all that yes it is possible mm-hmm. to earn a living through nothing but communicating about wine yeah 
I'm very lucky. You can lucky. write about cider and be sometimes. Yeah, I'm, <laughs> yeah, well, now, yes, more and more I'm doing other drinks as well because sure. I'm interested in them. And yep. I think, um, you know, that the kind of people who are interested in, I don't know, New Wave Chardonnay or something are probably the kind of people who are interested in other developments in the drinks world. Sure, you of know? course. You know, it's not like people are just drinking wine. Not anymore. even alcohol, you know, like coffee and uh, tea that's and right. stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, 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 that's right. So you kind of got to be across a little bit of all those things. Uh, but I, I'm acutely aware that I've been very lucky mm-hmm. to be able to, uh, yeah, support myself pretty much just on the writing and the communication without having to do other things. Mm. As far as the books you've written, um, how did you kind of come up with the, the concepts or what were the, 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 um, the, what was the rationale behind some of those books? Yeah, so Red and White was the first. Uh, and then uh, I wrote a book called Crush in 2000, which was like a, um, a, a new look at, Australian wine. That was the first book that I, I read of yours. So that was that was much more conventional in that, you know, it had a chapter on the Arrow Valley, a yeah. chapter on the Mornington Peninsula, a chapter on the Clare. Again, beautiful on, photos. Yeah, again, I worked on that with A.D. Lander. Right. So it, it, it does make such a difference if you're out in a vineyard somewhere and you're writing about that vineyard yeah. and you're looking at what A.D.'s taking it's going to influence how I write. So sure. there is a connection between the, the pictures and the words, particularly in red and white that um, you don't realise when you read it, but it's there. Mm-hmm. Uh, we, we initiated that. Then there's other books that other people have asked me to write. So uh, a publisher in the UK looked at Red and White and said, can you do something like that for us? So we had to come up with a, you know, a new take on what we'd already done. You know, So we did that. Um, in recent years, uh, the book in 2010 called The Future Makers, which mm-hmm. is about kind of taking Crush to a, to a deeper level and, and as in it's a much bigger book um, and going into the issues that, that face Australian wine such as climate change and changing tastes in different grape varieties and things like that. Um, that was absolutely out of my... Um, I drove that. That's mm-hmm. like an encapsulated all the things that I was really interested in, am interested in, in Australian wine. The next book I did was The History of Australian Wine. That was a commission. Right. So that was Melbourne University Publishing had been commissioned themselves to write this or to turn a series of interviews, just like this one that somebody had done with you know a whole heap of people in the wine industry, many of whom subsequently died because they were very old when they did the interview. Mm. Um, you know, it's people, movers and shakers in the industry throughout the 20th century, this guy spent a long time interviewing all these people so that we had to... MUP were asked to kind of turn those oral histories into a book Mm -hmm. so that was that was not they came to me and said can you that was just not just but that was a job if you see what i mean yeah but something i'm fascinated in because i think if you want to understand where we are now in australian wine and culture and where we're heading you've really got to understand what came before i think that that's something that unfortunately gets missed with uh, a lot of the uh, the young people uh <laughs> like it, it's all well and good to be really jumping on board with the kind of the new wave and the way that australian wine is evolving it's a yeah. it's a fantastic time that what is wine or what is quality or what is australian wine in particular um the, the conversation is changing all the time but i think that what is missing is that they're not understanding and certainly not appreciating respecting what's come before that's right and that's where like books like, you know, like, like that uh, are really going to hopefully open people's eyes a little bit. Yeah, and, and, and that's why, you know, that's why I was very keen to do it because uh, I was going to learn a lot of stuff as well. Sure. So it helps me with being able to put things into context. It's a really, um, you know, you see some of the things, some of the trends at the moment in wine and they appear to have come out of nowhere mm. and they appear to be very radical. Mm. But in fact, they are... In, in many ways, a return to what's happened before. Absolutely. And one of the best examples of, well, natural wines won, you know, people who are doing as little as possible to their wine are really in many ways following the ways that their grandparents would have been making wine. Yeah, of course. Because they didn't and have the technology. The they didn't have challenges the challenges that we right. have now. One of, the, one of the, the breakthroughs for me was visiting um, Anton von Klopper mm-hmm. from Lucy Margot, Domaine Lucy Wines in the Adelaide Hills. Yep. And the guy, you know, makes wine in a 
wooden shack on a dirt floor with no power. Very rudimentary. And you think, oh, you know, well, he's just, it, it sounds revolutionary. It sounds like he's being a hippie in the hills, and he is being a hippie in the hills. Uh, but there's a spirit at work mm. in what he's doing that is, has a direct line back to Maurice O'Shea. Yes. Who is a legendary, a legend of Australian wine. You know, if there are two winemakers that are held up as the kind of, you know, Legends of Australian red wine making, particularly it's Can Max I guess? Schubert. Oh, I was going to guess. I was going to guess Max Schubert. Max Schubert at Penfolds. Everybody knows that story because it's been so beautifully uh, mythologized by Penfolds. Yeah. And in the same the way that Maud Chan, in the same way that Maud Chan, none of mythologized Dom, Dom Perignon, Perignon. That's right. So, so uh, you know, it, it's <laughs> brand building of and it's <laughs> myth making. But Maurice O'Shea <laughs> has the same, you know, this um, unassailable position as maker of legendary, great legendary wines yeah. in Australia. And yet the same people very often who idolise O'Shea and talk with rapture about the great O'Shea wines they've had that O'Shea made in a tin shed, dirt floor, no power yeah. back in the 1930s yeah. are threatened by and dismiss Anton in his shed, dirt floor, no power because of time, I suppose. The mm. difference between those two people is that O'Shea is now seen as a legend and, a, and an icon and a pioneer, whereas Anton is seen as an iconoclast and yeah. a rebel yeah. uh, and a threat to the establishment. Yeah. I would say that um, I think the big, the, the big point about that is the fact that Anton is fortunate enough that he can actually make that choice, yeah. whereas Maurice O'Shea, you That's know, I've, and I've only just read for the first yeah, time yeah. Campbell's book, yeah. Um, and so I, you know, I, I, it's very fresh in my mind, that story, you know, he you know, chose to, I guess the choice that he made was to make wines that no one was particularly interested in at the time. Right, yeah. But as far as the making of it, he had to work with what he had. That's right. Whereas Anton, you know, and, and many others yeah. are choosing to work that's in right. that rudimentary way. But, but they're, that's right. But they're doing it in, in, with an understanding of this historical tradition. Of course. Which, which means that it's not just kind of rebellion for its own sake. It's actually yeah. uh, a little bit deeper than that. The other thing about, and I've just, I've written about this recently, which is why it's in my mind, is is Anton and, and a number of the other people who are shaking up Australian wine? A lot of them are working and living like across the hill from each other in the Basket Range in, yeah. in the Adelaide Hills. Yeah. Now, I know that there are certain people in the wine industry that kind of view the amount of coverage these guys get with jealousy and and resentment because mm. they appear to be, you know, sucking up a lot of the publicity. They're doing exciting things, but in a way, there's absolutely no difference there, to my mind, with um, like all the doctors and yeah. pioneers in Margaret River in the late 60s and 70s yep. who sucked up a lot of publicity and, and, and attention when those wines started coming out yeah. to the late 80s in the Barossa when Rockford and Peter Lehman and a lot of those other, Charlie Melton and people like that, all turned a little tiny part of central Barossa into the, the the hub. It was the vortex. It was where everything was happening. Yeah. So you had this historically happening, uh, uh, the, the hunter in the 60s, same story. You had this, and it's the same with art, it's the same with music, it's the same with so many other cultural things that we enjoy and appreciate. There are certain times in history when certain people get together in a certain place and something changes. Mm. And so the basket range the is where it's at now. Yeah. The Hunter was where it was at in the 60s. The Margaret River was where it was at in the 70s. Marlborough was where it was at with Sauvignon Blanc in the 80s. You know what I mean? So there's mm -hmm. this, it's just, it's, you, if you understand the historical context, it helps really give you greater understanding of what's going on now and what might happen next. It, what, what's interesting is that um, people kind of will say, but these guys, the amount of wine that they're making contributes so little into the grand scheme of things. It doesn't matter. You know, we all make so much more wine oh, and matter. so many more people are drinking our wine than their wines, yet yeah. why are they getting so much attention? Yeah. You know, and, and like if you look in the context of, um, of Europe, for example, you know, Bordeaux makes so much wine and yet, you know, the, the cool thing to talk about is the Jura. Yeah. And they say, but... What, why is people so interested in Jura? They make so little wine and they're so rustic and, you know, we make the world's best wine. I guess it's sort of the way that things change, the way that people's um, – I guess it's, it's to do with taste, but the passage of time where people are taught that what, what wine quality is and then when something comes along that kind of 
disagrees or there's there's some sort of conflict with what they perceive to be of quality or what they understand, mm. then that creates sort of problems for them internally. Mm. You know? Yeah, that's right. And that's definitely what's been happening for the last few years. But that will change. Yeah. That's the other thing that history teaches you is that, you know, I'm, <laughs> again, been doing it long enough to remember the, fa- the craze for unwooded Chardonnay in yeah. the 90s. Yeah. You know, everybody had to produce a wine that was a uh, Chardonnay that was unwooded. Um, and most of them were the most unbelievably vacuous, empty, boring drinks. Yeah. But they were popular for a while because they were different. Sure. To what had come before. And it was a phase that we had to go through. Mm. And that unwooded Chardonnay, the lineage of that is some winemakers realising that if they backed off on the oak, they did actually reveal some interesting flavours. Sure. And there was a lightness of touch. And the and therefore there's a direct line between that crazy fad and the new wave Chardonnays that I mentioned before, yeah. which are lean and minerally and interesting. Mm, not textural. All them, not all of them. Some of them are pretty tough to drink, but, you know, it, it, <laughs> it's, it's, it's definitely, uh, you know, been born out. It does, these things don't appear from nowhere and they often influence other things. So, for example, I can't remember a time when there's been so many young red wines on the market. Mm. Like back when, I, back when I was starting out, January following the last vintage, so, you know, 11 or 12 months after the previous vintage, mm. you might find one or two juicy young pinots or something appearing on, on the shelves. Yeah. yeah. In May last year, I started seeing Shirazes from the vintage just gone. Yeah. So wines that were only four, six weeks old mm. were already appearing on the market. And ever since then, there's been a steady stream of 2015 vintage reds, and we're only we're not even kind of into the bulk of vintage 2016 yet. And they're all, and a lot of them are sold out already. Yeah, that is so different to the situation ten years ago. Why has that happened? One of the reasons is the availability of more interesting alternative grape varieties that lend themselves to that kind of style, like Tempranillo, young mm-hmm. juicy Tempranillo, beautiful red wine, Sangiovese. Sangiovese to a certain extent, Grenache, this kind of revival of interest in Grenache, and mm. Grenache makes beautiful young red wine, no oak, that kind of style. But I think one of the most interesting influences is the natural wine movement. Yeah, A lot of sometimes very conservative winemakers have been looking at these natural wines and going, but by not adding acid, by not adding tannin, by not putting this wine in oak and by using less sulphur, you're actually getting some really interesting approachable flavours. Mm. It's a bit drinkable. Maybe bit I should do that with my wine. So, you, so you're getting a lot of younger red wines appearing on the market, which I think is directly influenced by the natural wine movement, even by winemakers who would poo-poo the natural wine movement. Yeah. Or even going, well, maybe they've got a point, just in, in quiet, on the quiet. Well, I think um, Jamie Good, when mm-hmm. he was uh, recently on the, on the podcast, sort of talked about something he was excited about was to see a lot more lighter red wines as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah, You know, like – and, and – breaking this kind of idea that you can't chill red wine. You yeah. know? I think that's an excitement, exciting yeah. movement as well. Yeah. It, it, it just sort of it, it, I like the blurring myself. I like the grey. I don't think that wine should be one thing or another. It can, it, you know, it can be right. numerous yeah. different things. And, that, and that, that's where it's an exciting time, I think, um, because there's so much change and you know, people are breaking the rules to a certain extent mm. if rules even existed. So if you had to guess, if, if you wanted to share with me, what do you think may be the next interesting kind of movement? What, what, what's the next thing people are going to be talking about as far as wine in Australia? I can't, I, <laughs> if, if I could do that, I'd be probably making even more enormous amounts of money than I'm already making. <laughs> uh, it's really, it, it's kind of, I've been thinking about this because once you get to natural, where do you go from there? Yeah. Once you get to the point where there's nothing to talk about. That's where everything's been said. So, so how do you grow your grapes? Well, I don't really do very much. And how do you make your wine? Well, don't do anything. Right, well, that's not a very good conversation, is it then? You know, so once you've got to natural, where do you, so you have to go back somewhere else. One of the, I think what we've reached, I like to think, is what we've reached is the tipping point of talking about process. Mm-hmm. So at Rootstock, the festival in Sydney last year, there was a very strong feeling that people kept talking about whole bunch fermentation and carbonic and how much sulphur they were using, way too much. Mm. Because it's really not that important. No. It's just a way of, of helping a wine along its path into the bottle and into your 
glass and into your mouth. What's much, much more important, certainly in the long term, is talking about how those grapes are grown and where they're from. Mm -hmm. So and the relationship. I think I'd like to think we're going to talk about vineyards more, mm -hmm. and we're going to be looking for wines from from vineyards, not from wineries. Because mm -hmm. ironically, the natural wine thing, even though it's about doing less in the cellar, has been the conversation has been dominated by what people are doing in the cellar. Yeah, there's certain, there's a certain detachment from the vineyard, which it's, probably it's sounds. It's interesting. It's interesting, but you know, for when you go to a tasting and somebody pours you a wine, and the first thing they say to you is forty percent whole bunch. Yeah, I like, I think well, I think we are missing the point. Yeah, I don't want to know how much whole bunch. I, I can probably work that out for myself from how it tastes. Yeah, or, or you know, it's 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 a minor thing. I want to know what about the vineyard. Tell yeah. me about who grew the grapes. Yeah, are they are they been involved with that vineyard for a long time? Yeah, um, you know what happened in that vineyard in that year. Mm. That's that's the much more interesting. I think that's a much more interesting story in the long term. But I'm sure I'm, you, I'm sure you had the same thing where you you got to a certain point where you sort of said, "Look, I've seen wineries. You know, you can just tell me about that. I don't yeah. need to see it. I want to see the vineyard. Yeah. You know, I want to see you know how how it's speaking to 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 you to, yeah. to end up with the wine that you have. You know, the process is it's just you know a step in in you know taking the grapes into the glass, but. You know, the vineyard is where it's really most important. I'm, I'm kind of hesitant about making any predictions because I, it's so. What has happened in the last five years was so unpredictable. Sure. Like, who would have expected that so many Australian winemakers would be making extended skin contact white wines mm. now? It's extraordinary how many people are. And having it as a primary selling point. Uh, having it as a primary selling point, talking about process again. Um, but but even doing it in the background, the number of white wines that we are that you'd taste now that would have a portion of a little bit of skin contact, but it's not made a fuss of because mm -hmm. people have realised how much more interesting it is to the texture and on the tongue, yeah, and how it can express a sense of place very strongly. Um, so I, if I if I said I don't know, I mean. I, I would like to think that we're going to continue to be more broad-minded about what is and what isn't acceptable in wine. I think that's a really good thing. Mm -hmm. I struggle with it because I, I, you know, I have certain prejudices and expectations about what a wine should be. Um, I realise, and I taste some wines or in a restaurant, or people pour me a wine, and I think, do people really like that? <laughs> and they go, yeah, it sells out. And I was like, oh well, yeah. I, I really like the fact that it this all these challenges in in wine are making people like me and some other critics feel threatened. I think it's really really healthy. Sure, you know to 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 have this discussion about does it matter if a critic gives a wine sixty points out of a hundred because they think it's too volatile or whatever? Mm. If that wine then does sell and sells really well. Who am I to say it's a bad wine? Well, that that's the argument against the you know the export approval that's program right. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, as far as a wine has to be of quality in well, inverted and we, commas. And that that approval panel has been yeah exactly. Trapped. So we're in this very interesting. I don't know what the answers are. I'm not I'm not saying that I think that just because it sells out, it's a good wine. I'm saying that, that having a debate about that is really healthy mm. and really interesting. Fantastic. Uh, so thank you very much, really, uh, Max, for uh, for being on the show today. Um, have you got anything coming up, books, um, events that you will be uh, involved with that you'd yeah, like to Yeah, there's a let couple of know? really, um, I think they'll be really fun events at the F Melbourne Food and Wine Festival. Yeah. So uh, one of them is a wild fermentation festival mm -hmm. that's taking place in Castle Main on March the 6th. Yes. And it's not just wine. There's be some really interesting stuff happening with wine, but there's also going to be sourdough bread making and kimchi and anything that involves kind of bacterial yeah. and uh, yeast fermentation that is natural in some way, wild in some way, will be discussed there. I think that's going to be really good. That's twenty five bucks too. It's like really affordable festival. Yeah. And the other one that's going to be a lot of fun is Richard Cornish, the food writer, and myself and Matt Wilkinson, the chef. Mm -hmm. uh, doing a dinner at a biodynamic farm in Gippsland 
where we're inviting people to come around and camp for the night with us. Wow. So you get to look at how the veggies are grown. Yeah. Matt will cook those veggies. We'll accompany them with beautiful biodynamic wine and cider. Uh, the cider is my own, uh, made from biodynamic apples. And then we'll sit around the campfire and, and just talk shit. What an immersive experience. <laughs> That'll be good. Yeah. So go on the Melbourne Food and Wine Festival and, and check out the website and check out those two events. Fantastic. And as far as people kind of um, following following yourself, um, social yeah. media, website? Twitter's, Twitter's the best way. I'm, so, I'm of that generation. Thank you for pointing that out. But just <laughs> missed out on the kind of you know need to really be on top of the internet. And I'm, it's dreadful, I know. But Twitter, yeah, is the best way. Max Allen Wine. Fantastic. Well, uh, like I say, thank you very much. No and worries. I'm looking forward to... Uh, to sharing a wine with you very soon. Thank you. And as always, thank you for listening to another episode of The Vincast. I have been James Scarsbrook, otherwise known as The Intrepid Wino. Please do get in touch with me uh, and Max if you like to share your impressions of this week's episode. You can send me an email at thevincast at gmail.com. But also you can follow me on social media, on Twitter and Instagram. I'm at Intrepid Wino and The Vincast uh, on Twitter is at The Vincast. Uh, Come to facebook.com forward slash Intrepid Wino to find my Facebook page and hit that like button. Uh, please come to the YouTube channel Intrepid Wino. Subscribe and watch a few videos um, of me tasting some wines. Uh, of course, I'd love for you to subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, uh, the Podcasts app, Stitcher, Player FM, any number of different podcast hosting, um, podcast sharing uh, platforms. And when you hit that subscribe button, you're going to get the newest episode as soon as it becomes available. And it would be great for you to rate and review the podcast as well. Of course, all the information is available on my website at www.intrepidwino.com uh, every episode of the podcast all my tastings as well as lots of different writings I've done in the past uh, thank you guys uh, I hope to have you on the next episode very exciting guest again um, but until then bye